In the 17th century underwent obviously a lot of political upheaval and change. The cataclysmic revolutions from the mid-century were remarkable in their own right, I think, uh, unleashing as they did enormous uh, violence and disorder and a fair amount of um, change, political change, serious political change. But they also unleashed a great deal of intellectual energy and vitality over the course of the period. And I would argue that the revolutions of 1649 and 1688 really need to be seen as part of a much broader process that was really underway um, for a much longer period of time, probably stretching back all the way to the beginning of the previous century, the Tudor century. And that's a process I'm going to call here England's inevitable gradual, but inevitable evolution into from a medieval personal monarchy into a modern nation state or something resembling a modern nation state. Now when we talk about personal monarchy, what I have in mind here is the traditional medieval situation in which it was held that the realm of England and all of its people were more or less the personal property of an individual monarch and the welfare of its subjects were essentially his responsibility or eventually her responsibility as we proceed through the, through the English history. Um, in practical terms, this really started with the Norman Conquest when William the Conqueror in 1066 basically laid claim to every square inch of England as his own personal property and then redistributed it to those whom he most trusted and um, wanted to reward for their contribution. And the glue that held and that created what we now know was the, the system of medieval feudalism. And that system was in turn held together very tightly by a series of interlocking bonds in which individual landholders swore fealty and homage to their overlord and ultimately to the liege lord who was of course the king. It also reflected what we know as the cosmology known as the great chain of being, which was a very simple idea that God had created the universe in a very orderly fashion and had created a hierarchy in which the elements of the universe, be they spiritual, human, animal, had all their own immutable place in the universe that never changed and that was appropriate to them. And that idea then translated into a political system in which each of the elements of English society, the king and or queen later on, um, and the people, the public uh, officials, and the normal population all had a place established in the hierarchy, in the social hierarchy of the land. The king's right to govern, and this is the point I would want to raise here, the king's right to govern was based not so much on political considerations as on spiritual considerations. That is the fact that God had ordained each monarch to rule and had endowed each of them with special intellectual and spiritual powers to do the job. Monarchs saw themselves and were often referred to as God's lieutenant on earth. And the reason that's important is they were not consequently accountable to their subjects. That idea had never even been broached here. They were accountable only to God. And for their part, English citizens owed absolute obedience and dying obedience to the monarch because he or she had been divinely ordained. And to challenge the monarch in any way was above and beyond anything else to sin against God with all the potential consequences that that might bring. That belief system remained viable for roughly 400 years after the conquest, but by the beginning of the 15th century, it was showing signs of increasing strain here. Very simply, it had been undermined by a succession of, let's call them undistinguished monarchs. Um, Richard II, Edward II, Henry VI, just to name three, um, each of who had called seriously into question the whole underlying premise of divine ordination. Surely God could not have been this reckless. Um, also, I think we have to mention the collapse of feudalism for economic reasons, uh, which plays into this a great deal because the result was, was um, the collapse of the bonds, the personal bonds and professional bonds between individuals which held the feudal system together. And that eventually gave rise to um, the 
decline in the respect and aura that the monarchy had usually held and the proliferation, I should say, of private armies and eventually the outbreak of the famous War of the Roses beginning in 1460, an event that spawned a, a protracted game of musical thrones, we'll call it, as a succession of claimants, all of whom were cousins, um, attempted to establish their own dynasties. Surely God could not have been this fickle. Um, the succession of Henry Tudor in 1485 is a key turning point here because he put an end to the War of the Roses, but also because he and his successors began to reestablish very slowly the mystery and the aura surrounding the monarchy itself. But the underlying problem hadn't gone away. England and the stability of its political system were still extraordinarily vulnerable to the personal weaknesses and idiosyncrasies of individual monarchs. Henry VIII's great uh, counselor and advisor Thomas Cromwell argued that you fix that problem by reforming and refashioning the existing institutions of government, um, be they revenue mechanisms, local government uh, offices, or crown law courts, so that the business of government can proceed on course regardless of who happens to be sitting on the throne. And then, more importantly, perhaps, you ensure the permanence of those changes by enshrining them in statute, in parliamentary statute. In that way, institutions become identified as not as organs uh, of the personal rule or mechanisms of the personal rule, but as organizations of the state, organs of the state. No single contribution, I would argue, of the Tudor dynasty was more important than this, the notion that every administrative and political initiative undertaken by Henry VII and Henry VIII and all of his children were accomplished through legislation and made permanent by statute. This is something I think we can attribute to the, to very successfully to the Tudors because this had two serious consequences. On the one hand, the legislation established a body of law that collectively, I think, um, contribute to a growing sense of identity, of national identity, English laws designed for English needs. But more, perhaps more importantly, it dramatically enhanced the role of parliament itself as an institution in the governing process. Up to this point, parliament had always been an institution, I mean, I mean, sorry, I should, an occasion rather than an institution. Now it's becoming an institution because individual monarchs found the benefits of using parliament at every possible opportunity to enshrine their policies and in a permanent form here. Um, parliament up to this point had always been subject to the individual whims of individual monarchs. They could be, in fact, called and dismissed at parliament's discretion only. That was the only reason way parliament came into play here. Um, over time, as the Tudor monarchs came to realize how important parliament was, Parliament began to formalize its own procedures and through time-honored practice began to lay claim to certain privileges, not least freedom of speech, and to certain powers, most importantly the right to control their own elections, um, which identified them as a legislative institution. Both of those claims, I might add, make their way into important clauses in the American Constitution. Um, Parliament's institutionalization, if we can call it that, gradually circumscribed Parliament's freedoms and required that it reconcile its own ambitions with the expectations of individual members of Parliament. And that was not a problem so much under the Tudors as it becomes under the Stuarts, as we've seen. Um, the Scottish-born Tudors, uh, Stuarts come into England with a very different attitude about government. James also was seen as an alien because he came from Scotland. And as I said, the published declarations of absolutist theory that James indulges in um, made MPs deeply uncomfortable uh, before he even began to govern and led them increasingly while he governed to spend a great deal of time looking at his policies very carefully. What happens here under the early Stuart parliaments is a major change here, and that is they begin to insist on accountability. The cooperative enterprise that had been Tudor legislated, 
process had accorded them in their eyes the right to criticize and to, to evaluate the Crown's policies and in order to protect, as they saw it, the rights and interests of the citizens. And the difficulty was that they were still forced to labor under the pre pretenses of divine right monarchy. Uh, and the correlative proposition that the king, as God's anointed, could do no wrong. Blame needed to be placed elsewhere, at least rhetorically, and it would instead fall on the king's advisors and on the public officials who did his bidding. They were responsible for mistakes because the king, as I said, could do no wrong. Beginning in 1621, as a consequence, Parliament begins the extraordinary step of reviving the process of parliamentary impeachment. MPs found themselves deeply unhappy with one particular figure, Francis Bacon, the Lord Chancellor, and began to explore ways that they might remove him from office. Uh, there was no understanding here at this point about how you did that. And what happens essentially is that Sir Edward Cook, who has been recently sacked, instructs his parliamentary colleagues to go back into the records and look for precedent. And they find one. In 1386, Parliament actually removed a former Lord Chancellor, another Lord Chancellor, from uh, his post in an impeachment process. This was Michael de la Pole on grounds of mal maladministration and corruption. Since nothing had been done like this for 200 years, nobody really knew exactly how to proceed, but what they did was follow the previous uh, example, and the House of Commons acted like a medieval grand uh, jury of presentment, presenting charges to the House of Lords, and the House of Lords then began, uh, in this case, to, to, to examine a case of bribery and corruption under, uh, from Bacon, and the House of Lords then began to investigate the charges as a, as a trial court. Now, there was some delicacy that had to be handled here because Bacon not only was the chief law officer of the land as Lord Chancellor, he was also a member of the upper house. So they had to tread very carefully here. Um, in the event, Bacon actually confessed to all of the, all but one of the charges and resigned from office before a formal trial could take place. But the House of Lords insisted that the formal charges be read out and that Bacon's confession be read as well so that the formal declaration of his guilt could be placed on the record, and so that the, the impeachment charges laid by the House of Commons could be formally answered here. Now, it should be noted that James I was fully aware of all of this, and he should have and could have interfered with them, but he does nothing to stop them whatsoever. Apparently, he shared MP's personal animus of Bacon and felt he didn't want to sacrifice his own political capital for his own Lord Chancellor. That was a signal mistake on his part. He could easily have argued that Parliament's proceedings entrenched on his royal prerogative because the simple fact was the Crown had always possessed an exclusive and unchallengeable right to appoint and fire all public officials. James's failure to protect that prerogative allowed Parliament to establish um, the idea that the Crown appointees were really officers of the state, not of the Crown, and that they were now accountable to the public, and that they could be removed in a public trial for misconduct, for professional misconduct. MPs certainly recognized the precedent they had established with, the, with Bacon's trial, and they lost very little time in taking advantage of it. In the very next parliament, 1624, they impeached the Lord Treasurer, Lionel Cranfield. And in the parliament thereafter, in 1626, they attempted to remove the king's own personal favorite and his Lord Admiral, the Duke of Buckingham. And James, in fact, was forced to dissolve the parliament to save Buckingham in this case. His successor, Charles I, his entire administration came under fire in 1640 on the eve of civil war. The first 15 years of his reign had been deeply contentious and divisive. Charles had attempted repeatedly to collect non-parliamentary taxation, had ignored the legal parameters of arbit against our arbitrary arrest and imprisonment, had attempted to completely compromise England's long-standing Protestant settlement, religious settlement. So when Parliament was finally allowed to meet in November 1640, uh, the collapse of his administration was very swift and very sure. In the opening days of the, what's called the Long Parliament, uh, they impeached and removed from office three members of the King's Privy Council, 
a half dozen members of the common law bench, the Lord Chancellor, a dozen bishops, and the Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> Parliament was determined in the first instance here, I think, to right the ship of state. But the underlying premises that had, established in this, had been established in the 1620s were also very powerful here, and perhaps even more important. Public office holders as servants of the state ought to be subject to parliamentary oversight. And indeed, over the ensuing year before the outbreak of civil war, that became a critical issue uh, between the king and parliament in their negotiations to avoid war and would always become throughout the war period uh, tricky issue in terms of establishing a final settlement. Parliament went so far as to demand the prior approval of all king's appointments to government offices. Charles, of course, for his part, rejected their demands completely out of hand and insisted that parla his appointees should never be uh, subject to parliamentary oversight at any time, either before or after their, their appointment. Certainly some of the motivation here was uh, driven by the fact that Charles himself was loathed and, and distrusted both as a king and as a man by almost all of the members of parliament here. But again, the general arguments in favor of accountability, I think, were very, very powerful. After the Civil War and a decade of interregnum, the country embraced the restoration of the Stuart dynasties in, in 1660. But for all that enthusiasm for new political peace, Parliament refused to relinquish the powers of impeachment here. And within a few short years, they put them to use again. Charles II's um, Chief Minister Edward Hyde, the Earl of Clarendon, was impeached in 1667, and a dozen years later, Parliament did the same thing to another one of his chief ministers, um, Thomas Osborne, the Earl of Danby. Uh, Parliament, I think, felt very strongly here that um, accountability had to be a continuing part of their responsibilities. Now, not all of these trials were successful. Uh, at least as legal prosecutions. The responsibility for indictment and prosecution always fell to the House of Commons, while trial and any subsequent punishment fell to the House of Lords. By this stage, the House of Lords had established its own reputation as the High Court of Parliament, and they took it very, very seriously. Um, and I think what happens is the House of Commons, certainly in political case, politically charged cases, sometimes went overboard. And what they found was the House of Lords was unwilling to accept charges that were not absolutely in sync with the established uh, statutory definitions of the individual crime. Uh, at least on three occasions, Parliament attempted to impeach, or the House of Commons attempted to impeach members of the King's government and failed uh, because, as I said, the charges were either rejected on, out of hand or couldn't be proven in the course of, of uh, parliamentary trial here. Now, having said that, each of these prosecutions ultimately achieved their desired political end because, in the end, they were able to remove the offending minister uh, one way or the other. In some cases, Parliament moved on to what was called an act of attainder and led to the execution of the individual involved. Uh, in the case of, of the Earl of Clarendon, he fled the country altogether and went to France for the rest of his career. And uh, the Earl of Danby resigned uh, mid-trial uh, to avoid the, the obvious result. Now, in the 18th century, something different happens. The growth of the two-party system and what we know as cabinet government tended to diminish the number of impeachments simply because um, accountability fell to parties. Um, there was very simply no need for legislative oversight of the executive when a single party was in charge of both branches of government. They weren't willing to put themselves through that sort of scrutiny. But that wasn't necessarily true in this country, and the power itself was taken very seriously by our founding fathers. They took a great deal of trouble, uh, as I understand it, to establish procedures for impeachment in Articles 1 and 2 of our own Constitution. Recourse to impeachment, impeachment was available against the President, the Vice President, and all civil officers of the United States. In cases of treason, of high crimes and misdemeanors, and of bribery. Consciously following the British model, they divided responsibility for prosecution and trial between our legislative bodies. The sole responsibility for impeachment lay with the House of Representatives, while the sole responsibility for trial lays with the U.S. Senate. Neither presidential pardon nor reprieve were available for those convicted. Impeachment, as Alexander, if I can quote Alexander Hamilton again, impeachment was 
as he argued in the Federalist Papers, a necessary method of national inquest into the conduct of public men. It served, he said, as a bridle in the hands of the legislative body upon the executive servants of government, and so it always had. Thank you. Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu. Thank you.